to his beloved son, effectually called to salvation, and set apart to himself by his spirit. Now you note that in the diagram, those three clauses are all parallel, and there are terms describing those that we're going to be speaking about. So it's those whom God has accepted, effectually called and set apart by the Spirit, can neither totally nor with finality fall from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere in it to the end and be eternally saved. Now that's a strong, emphatic statement. A little later we'll come back and talk about this, the, the saying or the expression, once saved, always saved. Because from one point of view, this is what this is teaching. Let's look at it a little more closely. In fact, we can come back to our notes. Can we look at our notes again in that first part? We'll try and see what we've got here. This section is teaching, A, that true Christians can never totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace. All right? Notice we're dealing with true Christians. Those, well, yeah, we do have to, to identify the, the people that are being spoken about here as the elect. Those whom God has accepted in his beloved, effectually called to salvation and set apart to himself by his spirit. The laws of the Confession of Faith and Reformed theologians have always acknowledged the possibility of people giving a profession of being Christians, giving an outward appearance of being Christians, being like the stony ground hills, being like the seed that sprouts up amongst the thorns in the parable of the sower, and yet after showing promise, nevertheless wilting or falling away. Reformed theology has always acknowledged that that under the outward preaching of the gospel and the ordinary influences of the Spirit upon that preaching, some people can be persuaded for time. They can give up an old pattern and an old world life and to all outwards and tents appear to be Christians. But then something arises and they drift away and they fall away, etc. The front theology has always acknowledged that that's the sort of thing that happens as the word of God goes forth. The parable of the sower is teaching that. Remember in the parable of the sower, what does the seed represent? The seed represents the what? The, the word. The word of the kingdom. The word of the gospel. And as that goes out, there will be different kinds of responses. Okay. What we've got here is pinning this down specifically to those whom God has accepted in his beloved Son. That expression, accepted in his beloved Son, is another way of saying those who have been brought into living union with Jesus. Do you think the temporary professors of the Christian faith have been brought into a living union with Jesus and been accepted in the beloved Son? don't think so. Those effectually called by God unto salvation, those set apart or consecrated or made holy to himself by his Spirit. This is dealing with a very specific group of people. The elect, the effectually called. Now, the confession says this group of people can neither, now notice here it uses two expressions, can neither totally nor with finality fall from the state of grace. Now, in a moment or two, we'll be looking at other sections which recognize that people like, that, that are true Christians can do what we call backslide. The confession of faith recognizes that. But this is talking about true Christians neither totally nor with finality falling from the state of grace. Can we um, have a look at our notes on point A2, A2 on page 1 there, where we've got these two terms, totally and with finality, described, but the wording of the confession at this point, so this is under A.2, 
seems to allow for those who may lapse temporarily on their profession and steadfastly or suffer periods of uncertainty. This combination of terms, the quote from Shaw and the Reformed Faith is, this combination of terms are intended, or is intended to oppose the doctrine of the Arminians, who affirm that although a saint may fall totally from grace, he may be restored by repentance, but since this is uncertain and does not always take place, he may also fall finally and die in his sins. How are we going with that? Getting there? Oh, it's not working. I think, well, it's ridiculous. Well, just put up with a funny voice. Please try and distinguish between these two things. To fall totally from a state of grace means you actually you fall out of that state of being justified, forgiven, and united with Christ. Now, Arminians do believe it's possible for people to be saved and to actually fall out of that state of grace and to fall out of it totally. That is, they're not one-tenth saved and nine-tenths living in the world. They, they are, you're back again in an unsaved condition, totally. But they also would hold that it's possible when you've fallen out of a state of grace to actually be restored to it by fresh repentance. So they would say you can totally become unsaved, but you can be saved again. Now the word finally has to do with you can fall out of a state of grace and never recover. Okay, got that? So finally, or with finality, means you can fall out of a state of grace and be lost. Now, you got that. I just want you to be clear. Those two words, totally means, is referring to the fact that you can totally lose your salvation. Finally means you can totally lose your salvation and never get it back. Now, the confession of faith is saying this. Those whom God's truly accepted and called and set apart can neither, can do neither of those things. They can neither totally fall out of a state of grace so that you say, well, you were a Christian, Kainan, but you're no longer a Christian any longer. Nor with finality fall from the state of grace. That is, of being justified, accepted in Christ, and set apart unto God. Okay? So they say, that cannot happen to a true Christian, but those who are truly belong to God, accepted, effectually called and set apart, shall certainly persevere in it to the end and be eternally saved. Now, notice carefully here, we can easily brush over these words. The first section is making it very, very clear that you can't lose your salvation. The second section, just in those couple of lines down there, says they shall certainly persevere in it to the end. Now that's important. And we can pause at this particular point, perhaps, to just pick up this common saying, once saved, all was saved. Now, that's a, an expression that's been bandied around in evangelical circles in America, here. And uh, what do you think about, what do you think that means when people use that expression, once saved, always saved? How have they generally used that? How has it been used? Is there an element of truth in that? Is this, according to the Confession of Faith, is it true, if you're saved, that you will be eternally saved? Yes. So do you think it's correct in a way to say once saved, always saved? Do you think so? Yes, we can say that. But is it possibly, is there potentially a wrong uh, use of that, do you think? Particularly in an easy believism. You're nodding your head there, Christy. What, what do you think? Oh, all right, anybody? Yes, you are. Right, now Yap, Yap has got his finger on the point. 
It's connected with having made a decision for Christ, irrespective really what happens almost since then, after that. You're saved. You've gone forward. You've signed a card. You've been baptized. You've made a profession. You're saved. Once you're saved, you can never lose your salvation. Now, let, let me ask you this question. Do you think the general tone of the New Testament encourages that kind of attitude? Do you think the New Testament says, oh, once you've believed, you're it? John, you shake your head. What do you think the tenor and tone of the New Testament tends to be? That's all right. You just... Okay, John has said the general tenor is work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Anybody else got another a verse that might? Why don't we turn then? Can we just to Colossians chapter 1? This is fresh in my mind. And uh, to me, it's an illustration exactly of the kind of message that we find in the New Testament. Colossians 1, verse 22. But now, verse 21 talks about how the Colossians were once alienated from God and enemies in their minds. And he says, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. That's what God's done. He's reconciled you through the death of Christ to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Then Paul goes on to say, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. So here's the Apostle Paul. And he's basically saying, God's done this glorious thing in Christ. He has made reconciliation with God possible. You were once aliens, but now through faith in the gospel, you have been reconciled and have this hope of being presented perfect and blameless before God if you continue in your faith. And that's the general note we do find consistently in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 6 is a passage which, again, is often brought up in this connection with people falling away. And if you want, we can discuss that a little bit more later on. But in Hebrews chapter 6, you've got this important section, therefore let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance, etc. Then in verse 4, the writer says, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss... They are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Now you see here, the writer to the book of Hebrews is presenting to people a genuine, authentic warning. They are professed believers. But it's abundantly plain in his warnings and his way of addressing these people that it is only those who persevere and endure to the end who truly are saved. So uh, he can warn people, and he warns them as a means of encouraging them. There's no grounds at all in the New Testament to say, oh, you've been saved, just relax, feed up, and, and you, you're going to go to glory. No, those who have been truly and genuinely saved and brought to Christ, are those who are brought into a living union with him, and who demonstrate the reality of their faith by persevering in faith unto the end. Again, the book of Revelation gives us that same note. Revelation chapter, ooh, well, we can go to the letters of the seven churches. It occurs almost anywhere. Uh, in those, where have we got? Look at chapter 2 and verse 11. Message to the church in Smyrna. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Who is it? He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, that's the kind of message we get in the New Testament. And on the surface, that appears to contradict this kind of teaching. It seems to be saying, look, it's only those who endure, only those who hold fast, only those who overcome who are truly saved. And, that, and that's true. 
It's true, and there's another factor we've got to bring into that in a few moments. But that doesn't still rule out the fact that the elect shall surely persevere. You see, that, that's where these bottom two lines are important. This bottom two lines don't say this. Okay, coming back to this first part. Those whom God has accepted, etc., which can neither totally nor with finality fall from the state of grace. It doesn't go on to say, but are guaranteed of eternal life. But very wisely, these men have put in, but these people shall certainly persevere in it to the end. You got that? This is being anticipated. Those who are truly and genuinely called by the grace of God shall persevere in it to the end and be eternally saved. Put this another way. Those whom God effectually calls, he also keeps. There's a precious verse in 1 Peter chapter 1. Why don't we turn to that? I love the older translation of this, but I think we'll still be able to pick it up here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter is uh, writing to these believers. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And His great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can no never perish, spoil, or fade. Now listen to this. Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. And the authorized version that is, who are kept, what? By the power of God unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. So Peter's recognizing that surely... The elect will persevere, but they'll persevere because they are kept and shielded in and through faith by the living power of God unto salvation. So just be clear upon this. What, what the reformers have taught, what I, I believe the historic Christian faith teaches is this, that those who are truly, effectually called by God, the elect, called into living faith, can neither totally nor with finality fall from the state of grace, but they shall certainly persevere. See, that rules out once saved, always saved mentality, which says you make a decision and irrespective of what happens, then you're going to get to heaven. Those who are truly called to Christ will persevere. Now, confession is going to go and talk about lapses and the fact it is possible for people to backslide, but we'll get there in a moment or two. It's just saying, those who are elect and effectually called can neither totally nor finally fall, but will persevere and ultimately be saved. Is that all right? That, that's, that's what the teaching is. But that's not the same as this super confidence, once saved, all saved, live like you like, and you get to heaven. No, no, we cannot. I, I don't believe we can encourage anybody with that kind of false confidence. Right? Let's move on then to look at the grounds of this. And this is really important. What's the basis or the grounds of this? This perseverance of the saints. Notice this is the subject of being brought up. It's, it's not so much even the eternal security of the saints, although that's what the theme is, but this is the perseverance. Saints, true saints, excuse me, will persevere to the end. Hey, isn't there some comfort in that? But we've got to find the basis of that in a moment too, so we'll come to that. This perseverance of the saints does not depend upon their own free will. Phew. Are you rather glad about that? I, I am. Let's just pause for a moment. Do you think that there is any one of us wise enough, strong enough, consistent enough to endure to the end. Do you think that there's a single one of us here that could outsmart Satan and his temptations? Jesus said to Peter, what? Peter, I've prayed for you, and presumably for the others too, that your faith would not fail. I think Satan could bowl me over in five seconds. 
so that I apostatized from the faith. I'm not just talking about just fell into one sin. I think that he could introduce such doubts, such confusions, such uncertainty, and such a degree of accusation that not one of us here could stand. He's greater than we are. He's more powerful than we are, more cunning, more evil. If the perseverance of, 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 of any saint depended upon the free will of man, I, nobody, I don't think anybody would get there. None of us would. Well, who does then? Who possibly can persevere? Only those whom God upholds by his preserving grace. So what have we got? This is how the confession of faith understands it doesn't depend upon their own free will. This is terribly humbling. Terribly humbling. Of course we think, I can do it. I can do it. Well, I don't think we can. Davi, do you reckon you could do it yourself? Do you think you could stand by yourself? If I could, then I could save myself. Well, that's correct. If you could, you could save yourself as well. That's about it. You could save yourself as well. So it doesn't depend upon our free will, but upon, here it is, the unchangeableness of the decree of election flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father. That's the first. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame before him. And love having predestined us unto the adoption of sons. If, if you would ask me, what's your ground of hope that you'll be in heaven? Beyond looking at the substitutionary death of Christ, what's your hope of ultimately being saved and persevering? I could say, well, my first ground of hope is this, that my salvation has its roots and anchors in the eternal will of God, the eternal counsel of God, the eternal free unmerited love of God whereby he set his love upon me, undeservedly. And that doesn't change. The mind, the decree of God, his purpose stands. That's the first thing. You appreciate that? that that's, it depends firstly upon that. The second is upon the efficacy of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 8 from, with, with a moment. Romans chapter 8. Now, most of us, um, and we've often referred to this in the course of our studies, but it's worth just going back again. You recall how we've got that golden chain of salvation with no broken links in it, where it talks about, verse 29, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. All of those are in past tenses, reflecting accomplished certain fact, and it's an unbroken link from those he foreknew to those he glorified. But cast your eyes down a little bit further here. What shall we say then in response to this of God before us, etc., verse 33? Who will bring any charge against God, those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. 34, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who has been raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now I think that one of the most underpreached doctrines in the New Testament is the priestly intercession of Jesus Christ now. James Henley Thornwell, a great 19th century Presbyterian theologian and preacher, has a great sermon on that in his collected writings. Never read anything else quite like it. But uh, he highlights the fact that Jesus, just as you recall the high priest Aaron and his successors in the Old Testament would enter into the Holy of Holies once a year, they would enter into the holy place interceding. He would bear on his breast the breastplate of Israel and he would enter in and he would pray for the people of God. Now we learn that there's a great high priest gone into heaven and he intercedes for us. What a tremendous thing. And uh, I believe that Jesus intercedes for those 
whom the Father has given him. I've just finished rereading my devotions, John 17. And you recall how Jesus in that great prayer says, Father, I pray for those whom thou hast given me. Pray not for the world, but those whom you has given to me. And I can still see Jesus in my mind and heart at the right hand of God, presenting always before him, as it were, the efficacy of his death, his atoning death. Lord, Father, he could say, I died for Christine. I died for Michael. Father, forgive them. He ever lives to intercede for us. Man, what a tremendous thing to know that my salvation and your salvation doesn't depend on my free will. But there is one in heaven who prays for me. And he never ceases to pray for me. Well, that gives me a bit of hope. The eternal counsel and electing purpose of God, the unfailing prayers of his Son. That's the second thing, okay? Third thing is this. Upon the abiding of the Spirit and of the seed of God within them. The Holy Spirit is called what in Ephesians chapter 1? He is called the down payment, the earnest, but he's also the one by whom we are what? What's the term that's used? It begins with S. There's a term used. Sealed. Thanks, uh, Alison. And sealed has that idea of what will come. I'll just read the verse for us again. What have we got? Ephesians 1. And verse um, 13, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel, your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The Spirit in us is God's seal of ownership, authenticity, security, and certainty. Marked in him or by him as a seal, the earnest guaranteeing our inheritance. In chapter 4, 32, sealed unto the day of the redemption by the Holy Spirit. He's in us, sealing us. Hey, isn't that great? God the Father chose us in eternity. God the Son dies for us and continues to pray for us. The Spirit of grace is in us, sealing and securing it. I reckon it's about watertight. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all engaged in preserving and upholding the elect. Man, shouldn't we be saying hallelujah? Tony's not here tonight, but I want to say it anyway. Hallelujah. What strong, certain ropes there are holding us in the way of faith. Because I know I would stumble, I would fall. First time a gun was pointed at my head, man, oh man, I said, ah, I don't really believe in him. <laughs> Left to me, biggest coward under the sun. But by the grace of God, bold and or timid and, and uh, weak people have been turned into lions. The abiding of the Spirit and the seed of God within them. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. There's a little expression in 1 John chapter 3 that we just need to, uh, to note here. See if I can pick it up. Verse 4, can we look at that please? Of 1 John chapter 3. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now, this, we just not got, I've not got the right one. Let's have a look at verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Here it is. Because God's seed <laughs> remains in him. Now, that's beautiful. No one born of God. Born, remember, what does John chapter 1 tell us? To as many as received him, to them gave he the right to be called, the right to be called what? Children of God? Is that right? Children born what? Not of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. Born of God. Those born of God, born of the Spirit, and have his seed dwelling in them. The root of renewed nature. 
So we have the Spirit abiding in us. We have God who has worked that new birth in our souls. So we have the seed of God in us. And here we have lastly this. And upon the nature of the covenant of grace. Now, as I understand it, what the writers of the Confession of Faith there are talking about, that ultimately our security depends on the nature of the covenant of grace as a Trinitarian commitment, a commitment by Father, Son, and Spirit to redeem a people. Will you turn with me, please, to John chapter 6? Because I think here we see a reflection of this intra-Trinitarian covenant administration or arrangement that makes our salvation so secure. John chapter 6, now I know I alluded to this last week. And it's not I've just got this on my mind, but I do think this is the most beautiful and, and, and it just shows it so beautifully. Remember, talking about the bread of life. And uh, Jesus said, look, even though I've been showing you all these things, you won't believe in me. Verse 36, he says that of John 6, but as I told you, You've seen me, and still you do not believe. He's talking to the Jews as a whole there. Then he says, All that the Father gives me. Now, I think that that expression, those the Father gives me, relates to an intra-Trinitarian. Now, we use that term, theologians use that term, to talk about agreements, or relationships, counsel within the members of the Trinity. And that seems to be talking about the Father as the author, if you like, of our salvation, the foundation of election, and of the Father giving to the Son a people to save. And here Jesus says this, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, he said, I will never drive away. Now, why does Jesus say that? He might have a rat bag like Hamish MacDonald drawn by God to him. Well, sorry, Hamish, you know I don't mean that. <laughs> Why does Jesus say, all that the Father gives to me will come to me? I can understand that. The Father gives to me because a little later on he talks about God drawing them. God's going to draw those he's given to Christ. So all the Father gives will come to him. Why won't Jesus turn any that come to him away? Well, he goes on to say that. For I have come down from heaven not to do my, my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Now I think that's really beautiful. Jesus is saying, this is the will of my Father, that of all that he has given me to save and redeem, that I won't lose any of them not a single one of them, but will raise them up to eternal life on the last day. For a single elect saint to be lost would mean what? That Jesus had failed to fulfill his Father's purpose and desire. All the Father gives to me shall come to me, and all who come to me I am not cast any out because it's my Father's will. And of all he's given me, I should lose none, but raise them up on the last day. One more, John 10. There's a similar thing over in John chapter 10. You might remember that. Again, in a context of the Jews struggling to come to terms with the identity of the Lord Jesus. And they said, look, tell us who you are. Tell us plainly, they say, verse 24. And Jesus in verse 25 says, I did tell you. But you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name, they speak for me. But you do not believe. Now here he says, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me. You see, that's that same idea, the Father giving sheep to Jesus. He says, My Father has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one, one in purpose, one in counsel, as well as one in essence. So Jesus is saying, Look, nobody's going to snatch them out of my hand. The Father has given them to me. 
Yeah. I can lose them. So that's what it means down here when it talks about upon the nature of the covenant of grace. The whole covenant of grace being founded upon that commitment of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to a united purpose of redeeming elect sinners. And a single sinner can't be lost without Christ failing in his Father's ultimate purpose. All right? So this is the way, theologically, the doctrine of perseverance and security and preservation of the saints is developed. Ultimately, it's founded on the decree of God, the sovereignty of God in salvation, and the fact that salvation is of the Lord. Have you got that? Now, I know that there are numbers of passages in the scriptures that on the surface do appear to indicate that people can be saved, but can fall away and can be lost, ultimately. We've discussed that somewhat earlier, and uh, you have to come back to the systematic theology classes next year if you want to look at that further. <laughs> right down the bottom we've got, from all of which, from all of these things here, arise also the certainty and the, assure, and the certainty and surety of the perseverance of the saints. So here you are. What hope do we have of persevering to the end, be it communist, be it government, anti-Christian governments, be it whatever, be it the temptations of the world, be it the pressure of parents and family or what, unsaved relatives, how, what grounds do we have for hope of persevering in the faith? These things. That is the foundation, not just my will and a power to persevere. Does that make sense to you? Makes a lot of sense to me. I would have fallen out the hole, a hole out the bottom, very, a long, long time ago, if it were not the great hands of God underneath holding me up. Well, let's press on to look thirdly just at this, because I think we need to look at this one. Yes, this is the other one we need to look at. After the break, we can pick up assurance, but there's still a little bit in this area of perseverance to look at. Spiritual lapses in the Christian life. The confession of faith, having asserted very clearly that those who are truly called of God can neither fall away totally or finally, but persevere in faith and are eternally saved, say, nevertheless, they, that is, those who are true Christians and called by God, through, they may, they may, and here's a list of things. See the three things that are in that, uh, that uh, layout there? They may, through the temptations of Satan and the world on the one hand, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them, and thirdly, the neglect of means by which they are preserved, those three things, they may fall into grievous sins and for a time continue in them, by which they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit, and by which they are deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts, have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and offend others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. Now, that's a big mouthful, but that's a very full description of what can happen. Let's look at it closely. The reality of lapses up here, their occasions. Three things, through the temptations of Satan. Again, do you think this is a real thing? Do you think even that there can be seasons of temptation when the people of God can become targets. Do you think Jesus, during his ministry, was exposed to unusual temptations, periods and points of temptation? Do you think so? Yes, there was. Most definitely there was. And I think that can be true of us as well. Remember in that prayer, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Do you think that Jesus was bluffing or was adding something superfluous when he adds as one of the latter petitions, and what? Deliver us from, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil, or many understand that, or that's a possible translation, deliver us from the evil one, the evil one. The temptations of Satan can be extraordinarily powerful, and through them, 
People can be overwhelmed and sneered in wickedness. So I've mentioned to you that sometimes after an intensive period of ministry overseas, you're exhausted, you're all given out and you're relaxed and poor, you've got just a big long <laughs> flight home. Boy, you can be prone to temptation at those particular times. And Satan knows that. And he can bring them down like a, th like a flood. The prevalency of corruption remaining in them. The remnants of just pride and desire for dominance and control and those sorts of things. They can surface at times. They can grip us at times. We, uh, it was interesting. We've uh, got at the moment four MTW, Mission to the World representatives just been visiting and uh, the college today and with various people at Covenant tonight. And the team leader... Dr. Paul Taylor was just telling me before he came away, his wife, I'm sure Paul won't mind me right, mentioned that his wife wrote him a lovely card and in it she, uh, she was dreaming of when they would be free to go to their holiday home and enjoy their children and grandchildren and all that kind of thing. And Paul said, it was a lovely card, but he read that and he opened it and, and he says he was just overwhelmed again by the surge of temptations and dividedness of heart and the longings for ease and security and uh, yeah, it's time you had a rest, you've been working too hard and who would be in a hot sweltering place like Manila all the time? You know? so isn't it, do you not think there are times and seasons when that remaining corruption, that remaining selfishness, the self in us, desire for wisdom, recognition, ease, beautiful houses, flash cars, speedy boats, all those things can take control of us. I mean, it does Mr. Milan, Darby, all the time. He had about 16 boats and 15 motorbikes back in Zimbabwe, and he just dreams of them all the time. Not quite, Darby. But there are times those things grip you, right? Yeah, they do. Sometimes the prevalency of corruption. Here's another. The neglect of the means by which they are preserved. Now, here you see the confession of faith. The frame is the confession and tells a lot of their theology. They do believe God's people are preserved, but they are preserved through what? Through the means. The means of the word of God and the means of preaching and the means of prayer and the means of fellowship. You neglect those things and your soul becomes barren and shriveled and you're exposed to temptation. You can, you can fall into, well, as a result, as a result of these things, you can fall into grievous sins. And by grievous sins, I think what again, the writers of the Confession are wanting to tell us, are not just talking about, well, you can fall into the sin of having a bad thought, an angry thought. Catherine, you should have done that. Oh, I, oh, I said I wasn't going to say anything about Catherine tonight. Anyway, whiter, you know, what a rascal or something. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about grievous sins. I'm talking about grievous sins talking about perjury, talking about uh, theft, talking about adultery, talking about grievous sins. True believer, do you think a true believer can fall into sins like that? Do, do you think it can? I think they can. I think it can. Satan isolates them, gets them alone, gets them discouraged. Introverted, introspective, and they can topple like a weak reed. Can do, and they fall into grievous sins. And for a time, continue in them. Do you think David was a true believer? Yes. Do you think David fell? Yes. Do you think David continued for a time oblivious to the significance and sinfulness of a sin? Psalm 32 tells us he did. And I think it's possible for Christians to fall into grievous sins and continue in them for a time. By which, by doing this, they incur God's displeasure. We know from Hebrews chapter 12 that God does indeed chasten his children. We know from Revelation 3, 2 and 3, um, that the Lord also chastens those who uh, sin and fall into grievous sin. You've only got to read the story of the church in Thyatira and Pergamon. And they've got grievous problems going on in the church there. And the Lord 
the Lord's displeasure is incurred. They grieve his Holy Spirit. Remember David in that Psalm 51 pleads, Take not what? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. It's referring there to the special anointing of the Spirit that was upon kings in the Old Testament. We know that that anointing was taken away from Saul, and David pleads that the Holy Spirit would not be taken from him. New Testament makes it abundantly plain as possible to quench the Spirit of God and to grieve the Spirit of God. And we understand that's what happens when people lapse into these grievous sins. When people do, excuse me, fall into this condition, they are, down the bottom here, some of the consequences of that, they are deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts. What do you think that means? Deprived of some measure of their graces. This is old-fashioned language, not the kind of language we would use today, but when people, when the Puritans, when the 17th century, when the earlier Christians spoke about graces, Christian graces, what are they talking about? They're talking about things like the fruits of the Spirit, 2 Peter chapter 1, those sorts of things. Do you think humility would be a Christian grace? One of the evidences of the Holy Spirit working in us? What would be another Christian grace? Spontaneous love for the brethren. Love for the brethren. What? Sorry? Yeah, a, a spirit, a Christian grace of forgiveness. That's a good one. What about... 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul talks about the Macedonian Christians having the grace of, the, even in their poverty, they were filled with this grace of what? Of giving. liberal giving. Do you think faith-filled liberality, liberal giving to the Lord's work and good people, do you think that's a grace? Sure it is. A fruit of the Holy Spirit working in your life. Joy, peace, forgiveness, long-suffering, generous giving to the work of God and those sorts of things. Now, when people, perhaps you've met people, who have got off the rails, do you think that those things continue in them or do they lose a measure of those things, do you think? <laughs> Generally, the last person a struggling, lapsed Christian wants to see is another, what? Another Christian, another Christian. I've often told people that during my university years when I was a young Christian, like many young Christians can sometimes struggle just to keep as close as we could with the Lord. And, and there was an older spiritual brother anyway. He was a fine, godly, upstanding man. And he always seemed to be on about level 10. And I wasn't always anywhere near that. Oftentimes level 1, 2, scraping down the bottom. And when I heard that knock on the door and in walked my friend Phil, I used to go, oh dear, did he have to come and see me, you know? And it's true, when believers are struggling and when people are not close to the Lord, there's certain people you don't want to meet. And that's this area of being deprived of a measure of their graces and their comforts. They have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded. You know, that's true. Hearts can become hardened. If you, th if you, for example, fudge on your tax returns significantly, even minorly, but consciously, or let's take it, I used to know temptations in this when I was doing research, chemical research. You'd have a batch. Here, here's one. Here's the sort of thing. Oftentimes, the preparation phases for soil chemical analyses took a long time, so you may have to spend two or three days grinding up soil, bringing it into a dissolved state, and then diluting it into all, and sometimes take two or three days to get it into a state to make titanium analyses. Now, you know the trend you want to see in your soil profile. And you've got three of your 25 flasks look good, but then you've got one that just doesn't look good, and then you've got another 10 that are right, and another one doesn't look good. Do you know what was a temptation to do? Fudge the readings. Fudge the readings. And, uh, you know, if you did that once and you think, oh, well, one rep was okay, the other rep replicate didn't matter, 
you know, you could quickly harden your heart and say you got used to lying to yourself. So it's okay. It's okay. And you, you lose the sensitivity and commitment. If you're not walking closely with the Lord, that's what you can do. You harden your heart. Doesn't matter, really. Doesn't matter if I cheat. Those sorts of things can happen. Your conscience can be wounded. You know what a beautiful thing it is, isn't it, to be, have a clean conscience? Isn't it a great thing to be able to go to bed and to know you've got a peaceful, quiet conscience? But when your conscience is wounded, you think, oh, I just hope that Davi Milan doesn't come round. He knows that I did that. Whew. Anyway, those are the sorts of things can happen. You can hurt and offend other people. That, do you think that can, true Christians can hurt and offend others? Sure they can. They can even bring temporal judgments upon themselves. Anybody, what does that mean? John, lifting up the back? To bring temporal judgments upon yourselves to bring what? Sorry? can lose your job. You can actually even, what? Get summoned before the, the courts. Even go to prison. Do you think so? You think a, that's what a temporal judgment is. It's a judgment that belongs to this realm of things. Sure, you can, Christians can, can uh, be guilty of fraud or pocket money at work and lose their jobs. They can end up having to go to prison. That's a true Christian. Those things can happen to true believers when because of the uh, conditions up above, they can fall into grievous sins, either through temptations of Satan, through the corruption of the flesh, or through the neglect of means whereby they grow cold and indifferent and sloppy, become vulnerable, are tempted, fall into grievous sins. Those things can happen. And yet, at the same time, this great God who preserves has his arms underneath those people and ultimately will restore his true people. He'll chasten them. He'll discipline them. Maybe many months, maybe sometimes years, people go through a wilderness, but he can draw them back to himself. All right? So this is the balancing thing. God does preserve so that they can never totally nor finally fall away. Even though they fall into those grievous sins, still get the seed of God in their hearts. Still got the Holy Spirit in them, how be it grieved, and can go through long, dark periods before they are restored again by the grace of God to a place of stability and faith. All right. Hey, we've gone over time. Is it just me? or It's still interesting. I hope it's interesting, these things. Let's take a break. Come back in uh, 10 minutes or so, and we'll pick up and then look at the subject of assurance. Assurance of salvation. Okay, thanking you. Now, just as we start, a couple of things. Firstly, I'm conscious that as I'm going through this kind of thing, I'm not referring very much to notes. That's okay, is it? Okay, they're there for a record, and um, I hope you'll find them good to revise and keep things in, but rather than just being tied to that, that's good. Second thing is, uh, Gus has an announcement just about some orchids. Gus. That's the uh, three boxes there at the entrance, so uh, I hope uh, some people know a good course for them, for if take them to work or uh, share them around the neighborhood. Just, uh, yeah, or uh, you just uh, kind of want to take a few home, that's okay, it's good to see them all go today. Oh, there we are. Perhaps you've got some unattached young men here that can think of young <laughs> ladies too. That's really good. All right. All right, assurance. Would somebody like to tell us, or oh, sorry, I'll just check and see. Ben and Barbara, are you uh, still back with us? Great, and Ernie and Alan still on, online? Wonderful, that's good. Would somebody like to tell us really what the subject of assurance is about? Perseverance has to do with continuing in the faith, kept in the faith by the power of God to the end, 
so that we overcome and endure and are received into eternal life. Assurance is relating to what? What's the subject of assurance talking about? Comfort that we are in fact saved. Yes, that comfort and that assurance that we are in fact saved, that we are amongst God's elect people. So, uh, again, just worth saying by way of introduction that this has been an area in which there's been a lot of, a lot written over the years. Um, Christine here comes from Scotland and from the Highland area or up, upland area of Scotland from a tradition where there were lots of people that had no real assurance. Would that be correct to say? And, and certainly there's a tradition in Scottish uh, Presbyterianism where oftentimes you've had people that have been in uh, worship for many, many years and have led upright lives, but have had no assurance at all that they're saved. The same in some of the churches in Holland. Correct? Am I, am I correct in that? I remember reading the biography or diary of Kenneth McRae years ago and when he was over in Stornoway. He had a large congregation of several hundreds, but when it came to communion and the numbers of people that would come to the Lord's Supper, only really a very, very small proportion that um, would publicly profess to be assured of being a Christian. And some of the uh, Dutch churches, again, Yap and, and others, Good and John, could help me here. But in some instances, it was almost viewed as almost presumptuous, almost presumptuous to claim assurance, to be assured, and to say that I'm saved. You say, well, that's a bit presumptuous. And it was in some ways considered any class really of not quite super saint, but there was just a special category of people reached that point of assurance. Now, that's um, partially connected with what the confession faith's talking about, but it's also, of course, related to Roman Catholic theology, where really because salvation depended upon works of merit, uh, you were never quite sure whether you had enough in the bank or whether what was going to be, nor for that matter, perhaps in some of the, the radical Arminian theologies where it was always possible to be lost. So if there was the possibility of being lost or of not doing enough to be saved, do you think it's possible to have a calm, settled assurance you're going to go to heaven? You, you couldn't really, could you? So, over against this, here we have the confession of faith's teaching, and this again has been the mainstream faith of the church through the centuries. This is the position. Firstly, on the right-hand side here, you see in this little analytical outline, I've got false assurance, and down below, true assurance. The framers of the confession begin by saying, although hypocrites and other unregenerate men may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and presumptions from their corrupt nature of being in God's favor and in the state of salvation, which hope shall come to nothing. So we'll pause there for a moment. This is acknowledging that hypocrites and other unregenerate men may vainly or emptily and pointlessly deceive themselves that they're in a state of favor. Pause for a moment here. Let's think of John chapter 8. Let's turn back to John chapter 8 for a moment in verse 41. The Lord Jesus, you recall, was in Jerusalem. And we can just ask this, generally speaking, before we look at this particular verse. Do you think in the course of Jesus' ministry that the bulk of the Jews that Jesus spoke to were confident that they were God's people and confident that they would be saved? Confident of glory? Do you think so? Yes, yes. And here's an instance in John chapter 8. Jesus is uh, talking in verse 39 of, uh, with these people are talking about um, <laughs> verse 36. He says, I am telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, <clears throat> then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham didn't do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. Now, they, then they say this, we are not illegitimate children, 
they protested, the only father we have is God himself. Now, here the Jews had convinced themselves they were the people of God, convinced themselves they were safe, secure, and strong. In Matthew chapter 7, 22 and 23, Jesus says, Many shall say to me in that day, what? Lord, Lord, have we not done miracles, cast out demons in your name? And Jesus will say to them, what? Depart from me, I never knew you. So Jesus certainly recognized that it was possible to be deluded with regard to our spiritual state. Again, we don't want to put ourselves in the position of God and of judging people, but do you think that even within Christendom and within, let's say, traditional Christianity anyway, there's been many, many people that are sure they've been going to heaven. But they may never have read their Bibles, may never have prayed, may never have known a moment of true pang of remorse. Here are many, many people through false hopes, or with presumptions from their corrupt nature. Presumptions means to presume upon something. Uh, and here, presumptions born of their corrupt nature, some people think that they're fine. They're, they're much better than Mrs. Jones down the street. You know, she does these terrible things. And I'm better than she is. Well, for various reasons, Confession of Faith acknowledges it's possible for people to have a false hope or false assurance of being in God's favor in a state of salvation, which hope in the end will come to nothing, yet, it says, okay, over against false assurance, it acknowledges the possibility of a true assurance. It says this, those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him in sincerity, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, may in this life, now notice these words, they may in this life be certainly assured that they are in the state of grace. Now, whew, isn't that, do you think that's a, a desirable possibility of being certainly assured? Miriam, wouldn't you love to be certainly assured? You're going to, I, I certainly want to be certainly assured. It's a most desirable thing to be certainly assured instead of always, well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. The confession of faith says those who truly believe in the Lord and love him and walk in his ways may in this life, not just in the life to come when they wake up and I'm there, oh, I know for sure now, but in this life may certainly be assured they're in a state of grace and may rejoice in the hope of the state of glory, which is from God, and which hope shall never disappoint them. So that's the claim that it is being made. The claim that it's possible in this life to know you're saved. And to be assured that you're saved. And to have a hope that will not disappoint us. Look at Romans chapter 5 for a moment. Paul uses that little expression there. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, being justified, or since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And Paul writes this, And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. Now, there it is. That's what Paul's saying, this hope. It's possible to have hope worked in us that doesn't disappoint us. And why does he say that doesn't disappoint us? Hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Now that's anticipating the grounds of this assurance in a moment or two. But this is the kind of thing that Paul seems to be alluding to here. It's possible for Christians to have a settled hope, a confident and assured hope. Let's jump over to Hebrews chapter 6 again, where you've got similar references to this kind of hope. Where have we got this? Uh, 
Verse 18 of, uh, of Hebrews chapter 6, talking about God having confirmed the promises to the years with an oath. God did this, verse 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Again, the suggestion, the possibility of a firm and secure hope. Well, what does that rest on? Now, this is a particularly interesting section of the confession coming up. Uh, to be honest, it's one of my favorite ones. Perhaps that's because I need a lot of assurance. But um, let's have a look at this. The nature and grounds of this assurance. What does it look like? What's its basis? What's its grounds? Catherine, this is the bit you've got to follow closely if you want to do your essay. <laughs> okay, this certainty, this infallible certainty, is not a bare conjectural and probable persuasion grounded in an uncertain hope. Now, whew, that's a bit of a mouthful. But notice that. It is not a bare conjectural. What does the term conjectural mean? Conjecture. Argument. Argument. Anybody else? To conjecture. It, it's almost an assumption, yes. Uh, you know, well, that's what... Uh, it's an argument. It's a, it's a reasonable deduction or it's a, an assumption. That kind of thing. Almost an assumption could be the best thing. It's not a bare presumption or assumption or conjecture that we're saved, the certainty. Uh, nor just a, a probable persuasion. In other words, well, I, I think I'm saved. You know, the best I can possibly get is a high probability. You know, if you're doing statistics, what is a 0.01 degree of probability or something? It's not, not even that, just a high degree of probability. So it's not just conjecture, well, I think, or assume, or uh, deduce that I'm saved, nor is it, but it says this, but it is a certain assurance of faith. So that's the nature of it, of this assurance. It is certain assurance. Oh, do you have that? That's a crucial thing. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> now, what's it founded on? It is a certain assurance of faith. Here we go. Here's this bit that's the critical one. <coughs> Founded on essentially three things. This is the ground of assurance that's being spoken of. Firstly, it's founded upon the divine truth of the promises of salvation. Okay, here we are. This is really important. And we'll look at one or two quotations in the notes if we've got time, because this is a very important area. Historically, our fathers have said assurance, the place that assurance is founded upon is in the state of your feelings. Is that what it's saying? No. The grounds of our assurance are not founded firstly upon subjective internal things. They can change and they do change. The first ground of assurance is this, the divine truth of the promises of salvation. Read through John's Gospel and you'll read again and again and again. Whosoever believes in the Son of God will receive eternal life or has eternal life. John 5, 24, whoever believes the commands of the words of him who sent me, etc., has passed from life to death already. Whosoever believes shall receive it. You know, that's a wonderful, wonderful promise. The jailer, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. First grounds and basis for a certain assurance is that God has said in his word, if we believe in his son, we'll be saved. Now, there's, do you think that's a sure rock, Darby? Guy, is that, is that pretty good basis? Much better basis than I had this overwhelming emotional experience when I was listening to a preacher. And I thought that God touched me. And I think I'm saved. 
foundation of a certain assurance is the infallible word of God. It is Christ coming and saying, Come, whoever eats of me shall never die. Never thirst. The promise, the truth of the promises of salvation. Happy with that? That's the first ground of assurance. Do you want to know if you are saved? Well, the issue is, have you believed on the name of the Son of God? Have you believed Jesus came from the Father? Have you believed with all your heart and soul he's the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Have you believed that if you rest and rely upon him with all your soul, that you'll be saved because of his death and glorious satisfaction for sin? Do you believe that? If you have, you can lie down on your deathbed and you can say, I have a sure and certain hope that when I do breathe my last, I'll go into the presence of God. And you say, why do you say that, Davi Mulan? Say, because the word of God promised and assured me, whoever believed in his son will be saved. And I believed and clung to Jesus Christ. Is that right? That's the first ground then. The promises, the objective word of God, its promises. The second is, the inward evidences or evidence of the graces answering to these promises. Which book in the New Testament deals especially with the subject of assurance? Anybody? 1 John. The little letter of 1 John. 1 John. Several occasions. Let's turn to it just for a second. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 is quite a critical verse. Now, interestingly, 1 John is written not to answer the anguished inner struggles. You see, I, I think perhaps at times some of our Puritan heritage anyway has got too introspective. And people have been looking inside themselves too much for frames and states of heart and feeling to assure them whether they've been saved. And they run into problems at times because we do go up and down and again and again we take our eyes off Christ and on his cross and his work there. Sure, we begin to get lost. We lose our perspective. We lose our grounds. When you look inwardly, last week, I told you, last week I had a struggling week and if I was basing my assurance on what I was feeling last week, I would have been down the plug hole. Um, but assurance not based on those inner things. And John's not really writing about this deep, profound, inner subject of assurance. He's writing really to a Christian community that's being certainly shaken by a separatist group that's claiming to superior knowledge and assurance and theology. A proto-Gnosticism, an early form of Gnosticism, an early form of claim to higher spirituality. And John is giving the community that he's writing to some infallible evidences that they may know that they belong to the true faith. So he writes in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, these words, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So this letter is written ostensibly that people may know that they have the true faith, they may know they have eternal life. That's assurance of salvation, is it not? Okay. Now, what kinds of things does John point to as evidence that you have eternal life in this letter? Anybody? There's two or three things. Sorry? Yes, confession of faith. But let's turn to, to 1 John chapter 2. Here's one of them. 1 John chapter 2 verse 3. We know that we have come to know him. Look at that, two no's. We know, we can be assured that we have come to know him if we what? If we obey his commands. Now, you go back to the Gospel of John again in your mind. Did Jesus say something about he himself, the true son of the Father, did he say anything about obeying his father's commandments? Yeah. 
It was fundamentally said in John chapter 15, I continue in my Father's love by keeping His commandments. And He says also in John chapter 14, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So, in the Gospel according to John, the promises connected with salvation tell us that those who truly believe in Christ, those who truly are reconciled to the Father, those who truly become children of God will what? They will keep the Father's commandments. Is that right? Now, over here. This certainty we are saved, one of the real evidences of, of that we are saved, is that we keep the commandments. We love the Word of God. We love the law of our Lord. Psalm 119. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. If you know that sentiment in your soul, you think that's the, the spirit and attitude of an unsaved person or saved person? Of course, it's a saved person. So this is what this is talking about. The inward evidences of or evidence of the graces answering to the promises. What's another mark of a child of God in 1 John chapter 2? If somebody is born of God, anyone born of God does what? They, anybody think of one? Yeah, that's it, guy. That, that is a powerful one. Let's have a look and see if we can find this. Uh, let's have a look in chapter 3. Can we do that? Verse 9 again. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he's been born of God. Now, you see, there's a mark. There's an evidence of a grace connected with salvation. You've been born of God. You have the Spirit of God who's created a new life within you. You can't just, excuse me, carry on willy-nilly in a way of sin. You get convicted of sin. You, you hate sin. Loathe sin. You struggle against sin. You fall into sin. So those things are real. But somebody born of God loves the commands of God. Now, verse 10, look at this. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Huh? Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Now, I think, again, this is one of the, the most clear evidences that we are children of God. We love the brothers. Okay? Isn't that true? Where are these Americans come? Picked them up on the airplane, off the airplane on Sunday afternoon. And, you know, we weren't even out of the airport before we were speaking just with a close knittedness of heart and joy and commonness of faith. We're just delighted in the fact. That night, just as we were finishing having a meal together after the service, one of them was Lee. I asked one of them to lead in prayer, and he says, Oh, Lord, this is just like we've met brothers we've known all our lives. Within the hour or two, we loved each other. Now, you feel those things in your heart, and you read in 1 John chapter 3, this is how we know who the children of God are, because they love one another. And that's the kind of thing which is a foundation for assurance. I know, I say, by the grace of God, I know that I am a child of God because I love you. And uh, love, love Krishna, love the people of God. Okay, you've got those ideas. So here, in the scriptures, these promises of salvation have connected with them certain things like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. The evidences of those things in your life are evidence that you're saved, right? So it's not so much looking at your feelings. Firstly, it is the promises of the Word of God which can't fail. Secondly, it is the evidences in your own soul of the graces that are connected with those promises. And then thirdly, the witness of the spirit of adoption testifying with our spirits that we are the children of God. You recall in the very first chapter of the Confession of Faith when we were looking at how do we know that the Bible is the Word of God? Okay, there are rational proofs, but ultimately... 
It is the Holy Spirit bearing witness through, with, and by the Scriptures that we come to be assured that this is the Word of God. In the end also, this is the ultimate certainty and witness. We have the Spirit whom He has given us. Let's have a look. 1 John chapter 3 again, verse 23. Can we look over this? And this is His command to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love those, or love one another as He commanded us. Those who obey His commands live in Him and He in them. And this is how we know that He lives in us. Okay, here it is. This is how we know He lives in us. How do we know He lives in us? Wouldn't you like to know for sure that He lives in you? How do you know He lives in us? We know it by the Spirit He gave us. The indwelling presence of the Spirit, the seal of God unto redemption, is this final area of assurance. Now, we need to go back to Romans chapter 8 just for a second. What a wonderful chapter Romans 8 is. It's just an absolutely marvelous chapter. Let's have a look at these little words, verse 15, 14 and 15. 13b says, but if, you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. 14, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Pause for a second. By him we cry, Abba, Father. Presumably, well, I, I just don't know. I, I, this is a hypothetical kind of situation. But do you think it's really possible for a non-Christian to cry out with the spirit of adoption, Abba, Father? I guess they can use the word. But what's behind that word, Abba? Intimacy, love, affection, security. Delight, isn't that right? All those things. Abba, Father. The spirit of adoption. The spirit whose particular function is also to witness in our souls that we are children of God. He enables us to cry out, Abba, Father. But apart from him, I don't think we can do it. But this carries on and says this. The spirit of, uh, verse uh, 15, it says, But you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now that's a beautiful thing. He testifies. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now let's just turn to our notes for a second on this because this is a pretty important one. Let's try and find that if we can. Uh, testimony of the Spirit. Okay, page 5, under B, point 3. Okay, this assurance rests on the testimony of the spirit of adoption in our hearts. This testimony is not apart from the word, but through it and with it. This is a point that theologians have spoken of. Does the Holy Spirit give a special revelation of this or what? It is a mistake to hold that there's a direct immediate communication of entitlement or assurance. The Spirit enables us to see the evidences of His Word within us and thus enables us to be assured that we are the sons of God. To claim assurance, the quotation from Williamson is, on the basis of the witness of the Spirit, apart from or additional to the Bible, is to claim a false assurance. In effecting infallible assurance, the Holy Spirit does not impart new revelation. Now, I think that's the, most, the first thing. When the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we are the sons of God, He's not giving a direct, immediate word to us, whispering in our ear, Yup, you are one of God's children. So we don't expect an immediate revelation. He applies that which is already revealed, namely the scriptural truth that believers shall be saved by bringing the sure word of God with the infallible promises that it contains and the actually existing graces of the heart to which these promises are made together. The Spirit enables the believer to say with assurance, I am a child of God and will be forever. 
John Dick says the Spirit bears testimony to the sonship of believers when he brings to light by his operations upon their souls the evidences of their adoption and thus makes their relation to God as manifest as if he assured them with an audible voice. Well, maybe that's maybe not that definitive and clear after all. There's a, I, what I want to affirm wholeheartedly is the Holy Spirit has been entrusted by God with the task of administering and perfecting salvation. Everything to do with the calling, sanctifying, perfecting, and empowering of the saints is entrusted to the Holy Spirit to perfect and to bring to fullness. You happy with that? Now, the Holy Spirit himself to the end of teaching, sanctifying, assuring, correcting his people has also inspired his word. The, the word of God's the word of the Spirit, is that right? It is the Spirit's word. It is his sword. So I think it is emphatically true to say that the Holy Spirit uses his word. He doesn't bypass our rationality and our humanity. He's given us a word we can understand. He works along with that word to quicken it, apply it, help us to understand it, and give us an infallible assurance of its truthfulness. And I think in this whole area of bearing witness to our spirits that we are the sons of God, he doesn't just whisper, son, 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 until we're convinced of that. But I do believe that as we read the assurances that to as many as received him, to them gave he the rights of sonship, to be called the children of God, the Holy Spirit works in connection with that kind of truth and he assures us we are sons. Beloved, now are we sons of God. The Holy Spirit takes words like that, that he's inspired, he takes Jesus, referring to his Father as Father, and helps us to see that in him, God's our Father. And in all these things, he brings and bears home to our hearts this profound, infallible assurance that we are God's children. Now, there are dimensions of mystery in that which I, I don't... I'm very reluctant to try and probe into because I, because I think that there is a tenderness and a God does the Holy Spirit doesn't just blast in our ears and say hey it says in there if you believe in the son you'll be called a son therefore QED you're a son of God all rational like I think the Holy Spirit is the spirit of the son of Jesus son of God Jesus and uh, it reflects, he reflects in our souls and he creates within our souls not simply the rational understanding of these things, but the delight, the joy, the, the affection, the filial tenderness, the sweetness, the security, all those beautiful things. Now he does it in connection with the promises, in connection with the word, but in sealing them upon our hearts and assuring us that we are the sons of God and our spirits he produces this love for the Father, which is the love of a child for the Father. Beautiful thing. Mystery. Wonderful. Okay? So there we are. That's what the fathers have basically argued. It is firstly the divine truth of the promises in the scriptures. That's the foundation of assurance. The second thing is the inward evidence of grace is answering these. Thirdly, the witness of the spirit of adoption, which spirit is the surety of our inheritance by whom we are sealed under the day of redemption. Time's running out, guys. And ladies, we have, what, only one? Oh, two of these left. Let me look quickly at these. Oh, this is big. But we've got to look at it quickly. Let me just run through this. This is assurance and faith. This certain assurance does not belong to the essence of faith to such an extent that a true believer may not wait a long time and be confronted with many difficulties before he's a partaker of it. There were some strands of the Reformation, particularly the Lutherans, who basically said faith and assurance, even some statements of Calvin indicate that to believe and to be assured of faith is really the same thing, so that if you actually just believe the truth, then that's, that's all there is. So you could end up almost with an historical kind of faith. Now, subsequent reformational development along the line of the Westminster Divines anyway have said that 
assurance, the subjective confidence that I am a true believer, is not so intimately tied up with the act of believing that everyone instantly knows they're a believer when they do believe. It is possible for people to go through a process of struggle and of uncertainty, even when they're true believers, and perhaps for it to be a period of weeks, months, even years before in their souls they come to that place of security and rest. Sometimes that's the result of bad teaching. Sometimes environmental factors, namely people surrounding you saying, hey, it is presumptuous to claim assurance. Sometimes it can be just a natural timidity whereby we do tend to swing and sway subject to our subjective emotions. Got that? So there are various reasons, and sometimes it can be a struggle. Yet, being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him by God, he may, without extraordinary revelation by a proper use of ordinary means, attain to the assurance of salvation. So what that's basically saying is it can be a struggle. Assurance is not so connected with faith that everybody believes is instantly, fully, and certainly assured of salvation. You can struggle, but these things may nevertheless be achieved through the use of ordinary means, without a special revelation of the Spirit with a blinding light saying, You're it, Christy. We can nevertheless, by the searching of the promises, by the prayerful dependence of the Holy Spirit, by ordinary means, come to that, and the confession goes on to say that we should do that as well. This is not elitism. It adds this, and therefore it is the duty of everyone, because these things can be achieved by ordinary means. Do you understand the promises? Do you see evidences of grace in your heart and soul? Do you know something of the spirit of adoption and the spirit of prayer? If you know those things, you ought to be very diligent. It's the duty of everyone to be very diligent about confirming his calling and election, that thereby his heart may grow in peace and joy in the Holy Spirit and love and thankfulness to God and in the strength and cheerfulness and the duties of obedience. The proper few fruits of this assurance, so far removed is this assurance from inclining men towards laxity. Assurance can be attained by the ordinary measures of the grace of God. Don't need special revelation for it, but by the use of means, the Spirit of God can assure everybody. Therefore, we ought seek it with all diligence that, being assured, we may be filled with peace and joy, love and thankfulness, strength and cheerfulness. Do you think, Mr. Holt, between two opinions is going to be filled with joy, confidence, certainty, able to testify to Mormons at the doorstep and all the rest with boldness? No, there will not be the joy, confidence, hope, and strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience if all the time you're looking within or looking behind your shoulder or uncertain. Assurance is a very vital and important element of our Christian maturity. Last thing we have to look at, and we can just flip through it in this, this way as well. Again, this is a beautiful subject, beautiful, beautiful subject. This is just a moment or two we can just flow through this, and, and uh, you meet on telephone links if you need to, uh, to turn off so you don't get an extra hour or so on your bill, just do that, but we'll hey, hurry through it. This is talking about fluctuations in assurance. You may be a true believer, and you may have a have genuine assurance, but true believers may in various ways have the assurance of their salvation shaken, diminished, and made intermittent. That is, can go on and off. Do you think it's possible? I think most of us at some point in time just shake your heads and quite seriously say, can I really be a true believer? We do go through periods of darkness, valleys of doubt and uncertainty. We can have the assurance of our salvation shaken, it can be diminished, that is, made less strong. 20 years ago, if you had asked me that question, was I a believer, I wouldn't have had any doubt. But today, I'm not quite so sure. It can be uh, 
made somewhat weaker or intermittent. Well, I have periods when I know without a doubt that I'm a saved person. Other periods I just am in the darkness, in the cloud. Okay? Now, they may have that assurance in various ways. They may have that assurance shaken, diminished, made in a minute, such as by ne negligence and preserving it, by falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, and by God withdrawing the light of his countenance and allowing even those who reverence him to walk in darkness and have no light. There are dynamics of the spiritual life which are profound, mysterious things. There are times when God wants to train us, when he wants to humble us, takes us through dark periods where no matter how hard we try to pray, how, how earnestly we seek to use the means, just nothing there. We just go through dark valleys. Those things can happen. Yet, here we are, here's the last little bit and we finish on that. Yet, even though those things can happen and true believers can be shaken in their assurance, yet they are never utterly destitute, that's true believers, of the seed of God and the life of faith, of love for Christ and for the brethren, of sincerity of heart and consciousness of duty, from which by the working of the Spirit this assurance may in due time be revived, and by which in the meantime they are kept from utter despair. Basically saying, true believer, even though you go through the depths, and at times can be deeply shaken, they are never ultimately utterly destitute of such things as the seed of God, that is, just that heart inclination for God, even the yearning for it. That's one of the evidences at times of people who are in the depths of doubt and defeat. They're still hungering for God. They're longing for this assurance. Nothing they desire more than to know that the Lord's person, the Lord's Son. I think that's the seed of God in them, even when they're struggling. And again, love for Christ and for the brethren. Sincerity of heart. Oh, some of the people that go through the most deepest anguish and assurance are, are scrupulous. Part of the reason is they're over-scrupulous. They're so sincere, so honest. And uh, again, they maintain this profound consciousness of their duty. Those things never totally leave a truly regenerate person. And it's from those ashes, those ashes, when the Spirit of God begins to blow, those very things then can become the foundations by which assurance is revived. And once again, well, you know, they come to a settled, confirmed plot, and in the meantime, they are kept from utter despair. All right, got that? So assurance can fluctuate. Very, very much can, for varying reasons. But in a true child of God, ordinarily anyway, I mean, some people do come to the ultimate point of death, still struggling. But in the ordinary circumstances, God has provided through the fellowship of the church, the ministry of the word, the love of brethren, the means whereby those who struggle can be restored, revived, and brought back to certainty. What a tremendous thing. Well, we've looked at two important subjects, have we not tonight? Perseverance, the persevering of saints, and that point of the assurance of our salvation. Two great truths. We better finish at that point uh, so we don't hold our telephone people up. Let's pray as we finish. Our God and Father, thank you for our study tonight. Thank you again that salvation is of the Lord. We thank you also that it's possible for us, even in this life, to have a calm and settled, certain assurance that we belong to you. And we pray that none of us tonight would be deceived concerning that matter, and that all of us would be able to go away also firmly grounded and settled in the faith. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you for these studies. Thank you for each other. May your blessing be upon us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you to uh, Ben and Barbara, to Ernie and Alan. Good night to you all.